Gentlemen, this record represents excerpts from a two and a half hour seminar in Philadelphia that followed a sales conference for industrial leaders and marketing representatives for more than 30 industries and representing 729 firms in the United States and five foreign countries. It serves to remind us of many of the basic factors of personal management of our daily lives in business, our social contacts, and in family living. I hope that you find it to be informational and challenging in your own life and to your own future. So, gentlemen, lend me your ears. Here are some of the questions and some of the answers, beginning with a question from Mr. Hansen from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Mr. Hansen asks, in our conference session this morning, you said that there were certain truths that each new salesman should recognize when he enters the selling field, that is, if he expects his investment in time and effort to pay off. In more detail, just what do you mean? Well, Mr. Hansen, I would like to answer your question by first giving you an illustration of what I consider to be an altogether too common fault of sales management as it relates to the hiring of new salesmen in any given organization. Several weeks ago, I was fortunate to be in an indoctrinational meeting of new salesmen for a Midwest manufacturer. The sales manager was trying to encourage interest and to glamorize the job, and he spent almost a quarter of an hour telling these new salesmen how easy it was going to be to do a good selling job, and he was quite serious in what he had to say. After the session was completed, he asked my opinion about this meeting, and I was forced to tell him that I thought it was making a great mistake to tell a new salesman that good salesmanship is an easy thing to accomplish. You know, it's been my experience that salesmanship, when properly done, is neither easy or especially enjoyable. And I'd like to qualify that statement by saying this. These new men, after listening to the glowing descriptions of that sales manager, were convinced that good selling was a cream puff job, that it was a simple matter of knowing your product, knowing competition, planning a good day's work, and seeing a lot of people. Well, when you add all of these factors together, these new men are going to be in for the shock of their lives. Speaking as a person that has been in the hard core of selling, competitive selling for many years, I know that salesmanship well done is a difficult, frustrating, and exhausting job. And I, for one, believe that it is extremely mis- idea with a new salesman that salesmanship is a bed of roses. Let's not forget that in selling, most of the personalities that you will meet are greedy and forceful men. Men that have one primary objective, and that is to get that deal. And unless you are mentally prepared for that kind of an outlook from your competition, your education will suffer a severe setback in a hurry. Secondly, the pressures of selling from your competition as well as from your own sales management is a continuing process and the recurring waves of tension and resentment and apathy will make it hard for you to keep a decent attitude toward the job unless you are mentally prepared to expect these normal cycles of mental conflict and periods of depression. It is well to remember that a good salesman must understand that he will be required to live under pressure every day of his life and that either he will control the pressures or the pressures will control him. I suppose after making statements like that, that you'd wonder if I was the type of a person that would recommend that a young man enter into the field of salesmanship. Well, actually I am, and I should qualify that by saying that I am an auditor by profession that I was encouraged to become a salesman because of the challenge and the opportunity as well as the potential income that good salesmanship offered. The best thing that ever happened to me was to have my first selling job under a man that didn't make salesmanship a plaything. Claude Holly was a man that believed that salesmanship was a 24 hour a day business. And if you're going to be good at it, you have to be better than the next guy selling against you. He simply did not have the time to mesmerize himself into the present day practice of self-indulgence. He sold hard and he expected his people to work the same way. You know, I'm convinced that you can't kid yourself into believing that just anyone can be is not true. When you show me a man that is poor when it comes to dealing with people or lacks the ability to communicate successfully, a man that is slow to take the advantage of directing other people's minds toward making a decision, or is hesitant to put a hard day's work in behalf of his own future, I'll show you a man that simply will not make a good salesman, and he should face up to that fact now and not later on down the road when time is running out for him. Along with this thought, I would like to give you a few suggestions, particularly to you new salesmen that are just starting out in this world of selling that might be of some great importance in your future income and your success. First of all, never fool yourself into thinking that selling is easy. Good selling requires time and preparation, digging for prospects, endless follow-up, and a lot of hard work. This you must be prepared to do, my friend, or settle for a mediocre income or be generally a miserable salesman all of your life. 
Selling is the best life in the world, but you have to give it your best in order to be successful at the job. The second point is this. Never let other salesmen tell you how it can't be done. You know, this world is filled with unsuccessful salesmen that can tell you what won't work. And they like nothing better than to undermine a young salesman's ambition and his enthusiasm in order to make their own inadequate work look better in the boss's eyes. Do not listen to these prophets of gloom that want to share their misery and mental anguish with you by causing you to pattern your life after their incompetent image. They will take great joy in killing your example. The third point is this. Learn to loaf smart. Now, I know that this is an old cliché, but it is a lesson that is particularly hard for a young salesman to learn to do successfully. Because the very nature of good salesmanship is a vicious cycle of products and people, problems and practices, a salesman must have several short breaks during the day in order to keep his momentum up and his fatigue down. But the successful salesman will always use this break time to loaf smart. First of all, he'll take his coffee break at a different place each time and try to stir up some interested prospects while he's in the process of relaxing for a few minutes. He'll get his hair cut at a talkative barber shop where he can find sales talk easy to make. He'll make some preliminary phone calls while he has his feet on his desk in the back office, resting but loafing smart. You know, one of the best salesmen that I ever knew was a nut from malted milks. And he would go get one every afternoon in his favorite malt shop. But he always spent that time writing birthday or anniversary cards or thank you notes on stationery that he had left at the malt shop just for that purpose. He learned to loaf smart and make every minute of his day count. There must be 20 or 30 or more suggestions for the new salesman that would make a lot of interesting listening, Mr. Hanson, but let me make this last one suffice for the moment. The best insurance for a successful day is preparation for that day before it ever begins. You know, it's always seemed to me that the day that stays full of action is the one that starts that way. And believe me, the accomplishment of a full day's work is, without a doubt, the most difficult habit for a young salesman to form. Most unsuccessful salesmen will deny the importance of planning a day and will steadfastly refuse to do so. But I have yet to see a truly successful salesman that didn't have his day pretty well mapped out before it ever began, that didn't have a pretty good idea of where he was going and what he was going to do when he got there before the first call was made. So let me encourage you to get into the habit of dividing your day into five sections, two in the morning, two in the afternoon, and one in the evening. Now, don't try to plan a day as a big lump sum of time. Take each section and make sure that each one of them is properly filled with productive action. This way, you will know every minute of the day whether your day is progressing well or not, and you can correct a bad day before it gets started. You know, like most habits, when the habit of planning your day is mastered, it becomes almost commonplace, and much of the strain of its preparation is erased, and much of its success of accomplishment is assured. I'd like to suggest you do likewise. Now, here's another question that I found interesting. It came from Mr. Sidney Dorsey of the Prudential Insurance Company. And he says something like this. He says, I have been selling for more than 20 years, and I would like to have your comment on a problem that has troubled me all through my selling career. In your speech today, you touched on the subject of communications and how to ensure that you are better understood by your customer. My question is this. What ways or methods do you suggest to improve the understanding between the salesman and his prospect? Well, Mr. Dorsey, I'm afraid that if we knew just how little of our sales conversation really gets through to our prospect, we might all be convinced that we should start a new language. But this is not a new thing. For centuries, people have been hearing what they want to hear and have intentionally turned off their earphones when things were said that they did not want to hear. Now, this is only human nature. Actually, Mr. Dorsey, ineffective communications is present in every day walk of our lives, and I'm sure that we're never going to completely correct the problem. Regretfully, when two people get together for conversation, the greater percentage of what is said is never heard. A greater part of what is heard is not understood, and much of what is understood is too often misinterpreted. So you can see, we have a long way to go. But to state it simply, getting through to another person is not an easy thing to do, but there are some suggestions for improvement of your communications that I'd like to give to you, and you can list them if you like. First of all, I think that it is wise to try to get over just one thought or one idea at a time. It's almost a physical impossibility to sustain another person's interest in what you're saying for any extended period of time, because an individual's attention will fade in and fade out of focus much like a camera lens. It is well to secure one point at a time before moving on to the next. 
And the best way to determine if your prospect has understood your point is to ask him to play back your thought to you, and then you can readily know if you have gotten through to him. You know, Mr. Dorsey, I knew a sales manager once that had a great facility for being understood, and as a direct result of this great attribute of his, he got more action out of his salesman than any man I ever saw. He uses this very simple method to make sure that he is understood clearly. As soon as he has completed his instructions to a salesman, he'll wind up his direction with this request. Now you tell me what you think I said. And in most instances, the understanding of what he said will be different from what he intended to get over. Thus, he can correct these impressions and get the job done right from the beginning. He is so consistent with his habit that every salesman that he has dares not listen to what he has to say because they want to pass the test at the end of the conversation. The second most important law in good communications is to make sure that you understand your prospect or the person that you're talking to. You know, we're just as fallible as others when it comes to hearing only what we want to hear, so it's smart to make sure that we hear right from the very beginning. The man that began the conversion of my life from that of a bookkeeper to a salesman was a powerful man. He was a man with such drive and power that no one in the organization had any desire to talk back to him or to try to clarify any instructions that he gave us. As a matter of fact, for the most part, we all went blindly along our way, trying literally to just stay out of his way as much as anything else. So we did very little to muddy up the water when he was on one of those order-giving crusades of his. And you know, it took years of working on a national basis before I really understood why this was true. Back in our dealership, we all agreed to a man that the boss couldn't stick with one set of instructions for a full day if it were going to kill him. But the truth of the matter was that his direction of merchandising travel was very sound and very consistent. We just did not hear him right. Let me make my point. When he would tell us with that pointed finger of his, I don't want to see you taking any more deals for less than $400 washout. Now, do you understand what I'm saying? Well, every man in that room to a person would nod their heads in unison, but not a single person there would dare risk a statement like, well, now, Claude, do I understand that this applies to all of our trade-ins? You know, we're running out of space out there to stack those Dodge trade-ins on, but if a good, clean Chevy came on the lot and we could only see three and a half in the deal, do you want us to pass that one too? Why, for any guy that would raise a question like that, he'd get canned on the spot. Why? Because in the back of our minds, we knew what he meant. He meant no more Dodge deals for less than $400. He was up to his ears in Chrysler products out there on that used car lot, and he didn't want any more. But my friends, rather than to try to justify our action, we walked everything that didn't bring us in $400, and he never knew the difference. He said one thing, we heard another thing, and we both made mistakes. Now, the lesson is this. Do not take vague statements or doubtful information or questionable implications from the other person. Get the story straight. Make sure that you get the story right in the first place by asking questions. He should understand you, and you should understand him. Now, the third point to remember in good communications is this. Constantly be on the lookout for people that are emotionally disturbed. You know, it is true that an emotionally disturbed person will hear less of what you have to say and will grossly misinterpret more of what you say than any other person in the world, and the reason is very simple. These people do not want facts and answers. Their primary desire is to have a sympathetic ear to their problems, and your best answer is to listen and not talk under the circumstances. I'd like to give you a true illustration of this. One day, while I was the director of sales promotion for one of the big three automotive divisions, a top field sales manager called me to tell me that he had just concluded a long-distance call from his boss in Detroit in which he received instructions to sell a certain number of a certain series of cars in three days or, as the Detroit boss had told him, we'll get somebody down there that can sell them. You know, I thought this fellow wanted some help, so I said to him, okay, let's get something into the mill. Let's get those cars sold. But you know... I couldn't have made a greater mistake. This emotionally disturbed man didn't want any answers. He only wanted sympathy. And when I tried to help him, he spent the next half hour telling me how it could not be done. Now, what I should have said was this. Tell me all about it. And then after he had told me all about it, then I could have sold my plan or idea to him. Now, you can profit from my mistake and be much smarter than I was. When a person is burdened with emotions, don't try to answer his problems. Just lend him a sympathetic ear. It's the smartest thing that you can do in communications. And my last thought on communications is this. 
Keep your conversation in simple words for better understanding. The longer the words and the more technical the terminology, the more difficult the understanding. And let me give you this illustration. For those of you that have ever taken a jet air trip, you'll remember that the stewardess will come on the intercom system while the plane is taxiing out to the takeoff and explain the oxygen system in the jets. It's a federal law that she acquaint the passengers with the survival equipment. But she begins off by talking about cabin pressurization and altitude control that is automatically adjusted for individual comfort. And then she will continue normally in a monotone saying something like this. If by chance depressurization is actuated by some malfunction in the automatic pressure system, a small oxygen mask will eject itself from a secured compartment for immediate adjustment by means of the elastic contouring straps. Why, man, this is enough to jar your confidence if you fly 100,000 air miles a year. But look how simple she could have made it. She could have said, in the event of the need for increased oxygen during the flight, a small compartment will open and this small mask will be available for you to fit over your face comfortably like this. Please continue to breathe comfortably until we instruct you to remove your mask. Thank you. Now check your seat belts for takeoff. These are simple words that get the message through and takes the confusion out. Try it on your next presentation, Mr. Dorsey. I think you'll agree that it'll work for you too. Continuing with our question and answer seminar, we have this question from Mr. Anthony Licata with the Prescott Bearing Company. In your conversation before the convention today, you stressed the value of the three C's to improve your selling ability. One, be courteous. Two, be competent. And three, be conclusive. I'd like to hear more about the points you made on courtesy in salesmanship. Well, I'd be happy to comment on it a little further, Mr. Licata. As I indicated this morning, there are dozens upon dozens of do's and don'ts in courteous salesmanship. But let me review quite briefly some of our common, perhaps unnoticed, and unthinking breaches of courtesy in salesmanship. It may pay you to make a brief note if you like. First of all, I think that a smart salesman's courtesy begins by getting on the good side of the secretary or receptionist that stands between him and his prospective buyer. You know, a little care and thoughtfulness on your part will often get you inside while your competitor sits outside and cools his heels wondering why that stupid dame never cooperates with him. Now, these young ladies are just as human and sensitive to kind words and manly courtesies as the next person, and her ability to return kindness with kindness is one of her greatest virtues. You know, I can never say enough about the ability of my secretary while I was on the staff of the Chrysler Corporation. Martha Erickson was a keenly sensitive woman, and a hard one too, I'm sure, as the occasion required it. If she didn't think that a person was serving a good purpose in getting in to see me, she had ways of seeing that such a condition never materialized. I've had a few people make complaints about Martha's independent mannerisms as a secretary, but I've always believed that if a guy couldn't sell Martha on the fact that it made sense to get in to see me, he was too stupid for me to waste my time with him anyhow. I found this to be true wherever I go. The greatest thing that I gave up when I left the Chrysler Corporation was my secretary, and I've missed her every day since then. The moral is this. Get the secretaries on your side, because this is the winning side, because I have yet to see a good secretary lose a battle anywhere. Point two in courteous salesmanship is this, or perhaps we can call courteous salesmanship smart selling. But my point is to make sure that you never become overly friendly with your prospect. Now, just because a customer calls you Fred is no license for you to call him Charlie, especially if he has any year seniority over you. You know, a fluent use of the word Mr. can only profit you, especially if you're in the company of a second or a third person or the prospect's employer. When you try to move in, so to speak, with a prospect on a first name basis and act like you want to get buddy buddy with him, you're going to find yourself in trouble and never be conscious of it. So bide your time. If he wants you to call him Charlie, he'll tell you so. But don't assume the hazard without an invitation to do so. Thirdly, I would encourage you to try to avoid creating an image of yourself as a know-it-all. In a selling conversation, try not to monopolize the conversation by talking all the time. Encourage your prospect to get into the conversation and express his viewpoints. One salesman asked me one day, he said, Hartzell, what do you do with a guy that refuses to talk? Well, that's a rather simple one. Ask him a question that demands more than an answer of yes or no and simply wait him out. The salesman that your prospect just talked to before he saw you perhaps committed himself as a big mouth because he did not know how to make a prospect get inside the sale, but you do. You know, it's a law of salesmanship that only one of the two of you knows what it's going to take to close that sale and that person is the prospect. 
Now, until you can get his expressions, his problems identified and solved, his desires and wants resolved, there's not going to be a sale in the first place. And the only way to accomplish that need is to get him inside the conversation. So don't talk yourself into a sale and out of one at the same time. Remember, the only thing that you can repeat is information you already know. But most of what the other man will say is information you must have to win. So let him do most of the talking. Now, here is a point of salesman courtesy that is a common fallacy of far too many of us. While in the company of a customer, whether it be male or female or both, don't ever light up a smoke unless you're invited to do so or have asked permission to do so. Over 50% of the people that you will be doing business with do not smoke. Many buyers will take a dim viewpoint of both you and your selling job if they have to live through a disagreeable odor in order to buy from you. You know, I'm more and more convinced that there is a growing resentment all over this country by non-smokers against inconsiderate salesmen that put their personal habits and enjoyment ahead of the customer's likes and dislikes. I'm sure that no thinking salesman would intentionally offend a prospect with an overripe case of B.O., which I'm sure is no worse to some people than mellow-aged tobacco smoke, regardless of whether it was eliminated through charcoal-impregnated spin filters or not. Give it some thought if you enjoy smoking. Now, time does not permit us to spend more time on such basic behavior patterns as table manners while attending business luncheons, our speech courtesies and how to make voice tones and inflections work for you. Time could be well spent on the use of facial reactions, polished gestures, and how to avoid annoying, nervous mannerisms. But I would like to take the time to touch on two very simple courtesies that in the rush of the day, we might well overlook. The first is that of being careful of the stories that you want to tell during a sales presentation. It's open season these days on religious, political, and racial stories, but I would encourage you as a professional salesman to stick to the business of selling and let your prospect be the comedian. You don't gain a thing in the world by trying to top his last story. It may have been his best story. And I have yet to see the salesman walk off with an order because he could out-dirt his prospect in telling shaggy dog stories. People are sensitive and they have some unusual quirks in their makeup concerning opinions and precepts. And your purpose as a salesman is not to crusade for anything except your company and its product. So your safest rule of action is to restrain yourself to stories where the laugh can be on you and perhaps the deal can be on him. The last thought is that of telephone courtesies. And may I give you a quick rundown on some very valuable do's that will mark you as a courteous and competent salesman? First of all, answer your phone promptly. Second, state your company's name and your name immediately. Three, if it is necessary to leave the line, always excuse yourself and then apologize for the prospect's inconvenience when you return. Four, call the customer by name as often as it is practical in the conversation to do so. Let him know that you have his personal interest at heart. Five, always listen attentively without interrupting his statements or his line of thought. Six, if the person being called is out, offer to take a message and then thank the caller for his interest. Seven, conclude each call with a word of appreciation and then wait for the prospect to hang up first before you replace your receiver. The phone is a great place to be exceptionally courteous. I'd like to see you use it wisely. We have a gentleman in our audience that has written this question to me, and I'd like to pass it on to you and do my best to answer it. Mr. Alexander writes in this card, in my business, I have the occasion to pay a pop-in call on some of my customers every now and then. Now, there are several schools of thought on the practice of unannounced drop-ins. I'm just wondering, after years on the executive staff of a major corporation and having worked with salesmen all over the continent, what is your opinion concerning pop-in calls? Uh, Mr. Alexander, I hope that I won't offend you when I answer your question. But from my experience, I have grown to believe that pop-in calls are, more often than not, fool's calls. And I'd like to explain that statement. Granted, I have picked up many orders many times by just happening to be at the right place at the right time. And I'm sure it's happened to everyone here. But I have also found that for most salesmen, they waste far too much precious time on hit or miss calling than they can afford to waste. They're not expected by the prospect, hence the buyer's mind is unprepared to talk business with them. A pop-in call salesman has not prepared himself properly first, therefore he must be subjected to inferior presentations. Since he has not secured specific time allotments from the buyer, the salesman is exposed to limitless interruptions and distractions of the buyer's interest. Plus the fact that I find that pop-in calls have a tendency to wear out my welcome with a firm or a buyer. 
and that unless I come for a specific reason at a specific time, I can create a certain degree of resistance to my image that in the long run may well kill me with the prospect. I sincerely believe that a badly timed call is worse than no call at all. Now, someone might raise the question in the audience, well, if I feel that way about pop-in calls, how do I feel about routine calls? That is, a call of making a customer solicitation simply because he's next on the list to call on. Well, uh, I'd like to give a couple of thoughts there, if I might. I'd like to qualify my answer slightly by saying that in the instance of salesmen like Coca-Cola drivers or cigarette salesmen or vending machine servicemen, where routine service calls are mandatory, this is just good business practices. However, my belief is that for all other kinds of creative salesmanship, the calls of the representatives should be so spaced as to preclude a routine call. I think that the key difference hinges on whether or not you have something special to offer to him, something unusual in assistance to contribute to him, or you have some pre-planned program to discuss with him. I'm convinced that the word routine describes the attitude and the purpose of the salesman's call as opposed to the timing of the call. I've seen some salesmen that made every contact they made a routine call, and I've seen other salesmen that haven't made a routine call in their many years of selling experience. So remember this that if your purpose for calling on a customer is more valuable than the time that it takes from the customer to hear it, you will never be guilty of making a routine call on anyone. Now, before I leave this question about pop-in calls and routine calls, let me make this one observation. If you're near a customer and you have an urge to contact him, I'm talking about a real selling urge to knock his door down, you do it regardless of what I tell you to do because sometimes your initiative is wiser than your education. I have a card here on the desk that also dates back to a remark that I made about Mr. Lakata's question a few minutes ago. And this card raises the question concerning cutoff interviews or how to close a conversation. And they want to know if I have any thoughts that might assist the individual in closing the conversation and getting away from a prospect. Well, yes, I, I do have. There are several acceptable ways of accomplishing this type of a circumstance. You know, I have found over the last nine years that the people of the North are much more proficient in closing a selling conversation than are the people of the South. Now, I don't intend to begin another civil war by making that statement, but I found this to be very true. For example, the Southern and Western people are much more prone to say thank you with sincerity than are the Northern salesmen. But they also keep the sales conversation dragging on after they have said thank you far too long. Whereas the Northerner, on the other hand, is a purist when it comes to saying goodbye. Now, you can imagine my surprise when an otherwise curt and coldly disinterested clerk at the J.L. Hudson store in Detroit said, on oh, my first attempt to buy anything in the North, she said, here is your tie. Goodbye now. And you know that goodbye was the warmest thing that she had said to me during the entire process of making that sale. Now, this I have never had happen to me, even in the heart of Dixie. Now, the point I'm trying to make is this. A good severance of a selling presentation or a sale requires both a good thank you and a genuine goodbye to make the greatest impression on the buyer. But there is a third factor that is equally important, and that is this. Whatever decision has been made, be it to buy the product, to issue a purchase order, to allow another interview, or just to ask for additional information from you concerning the product or service that you're trying to sell, this decision should be the last subject of your conversation in order to ensure complete understanding and proper coordination. Now, let me give you an illustration. Let's say that you've just finished your presentation, have been preparing yourself to lead, and you want a good concluding statement. So here's something that will work. You can say, Mr. Bothwell, I'll be looking forward to your confirming order in tomorrow's mail. Thank you very much, and goodbye. And out you go. Or you can say, Mr. Stilwell, I'll see that you get the information that you need by return mail, and I want to thank you for your time. Goodbye now, and then leave. Or, here's another idea. You've just sold a car to Mrs. Stevens, and you can wrap it up something like this. You can say, Mrs. Stevens, we'll have that car delivered to your home at 5 this evening. I want to thank you for your order, and goodbye for now. And close your conversation, and that's it. This is a matter of habit that once ingrained in your makeup will add a definite glitter of a polished gentleman to any one of you that sells for a living. So why not give it a try for yourself? Well, gentlemen, by looking at my watch, I can see that this seminar has now been in session for well over two hours. Actually, two hours and 28 minutes to be exact. 
It's been a rare privilege to discuss professionalism with you as it reflects in the day-to-day -day conduct of the individual salesman. But before terminating our discussion, I would like to leave a brief statement with you to take back to your organizations and to your salesmen. A statement that I hope will encourage them to work harder at this job of doing the exceptional thing in their lives through salesmanship. In a recent survey, I read where 27% of the presidents of corporations in the United States with sales over $500 million a year came from salesmanship. By far the highest percentage of any one classification for jobs in industry. Salesmen like all of us are giving American industry its leaders today. From among the million plus new salesmen needed in America this year and the next will come the highest paid, most influential executives in the country. And any one of them might well be that young salesman just starting out in your organization. Today's salesmen can well be tomorrow's leaders of men. It happens every day. This is the challenge of tomorrow, gentlemen, that is here for the claiming by men that have their eyes on the future and are willing to pay the price of selling success today. Thank you for attending this seminar. You know, I wish that you could have attended the entire seminar in Philadelphia because it was literally filled with sales meat that I am sure that you would have profited from. But as I told them in Philadelphia about professionally closing a conversation, I've enjoyed using your ears, so thank you very much for your time, and goodbye for now.